Welcome back. Today's headlines of CCTV's news bulletin are Chemcom Europe's 2016 welcome reception, an interview on regulatory fitness, and to start with, some questions and answers from yesterday's seminars. Thank you, uh, Joey Lee from SARTEC Taiwan, and we representing a lot of group of happy users down there. Congratulations on your uh, latest version of a UK6 as well as a key chassis here. My quick question would be, when Leo mentioned about additional feature for uh, uh, downstream user communication uh, with the use of a key chassis, would you be able to touch upon that a little bit more? Version 3.1, which will be available at the end of summer, will allow you to uh, prepare within IUCLE, within Keyshar 3 itself, your ESDS appendices, and you can select your um, SCOM phrases there and put the, and combine them to the operational conditions and risk management measures you applied in your risk assessment. You can make an export. That is, of course, what goes down the supply chain, but the other element of what goes up is there is the development of the use maps, uh, sector-wide approach to structure use information to be able to communicate it up the supply chain. And also by the end of the year, at least we're looking at um, aligning KSR with these uh, structures. So, And the second question would be the UBC, uh, UBCB. Um, uh, what is the status right now, since uh, there are quite some UVCB registration, of course? For UVCBs, you really need to go back to the registration dossiers that the info cards and brief profiles are not explanatory at the moment. And we hope that for the next version, uh, using Euclid 6, this will be fixed. Uh, what happens with those dossiers that were submitted outside of a joint submission uh, until now? If we, when we move to the new rich IT, if we, ECA will take care of migrating them into a joint submission? That was your question. So the answer is no. We are not going to migrate them into a, a joint submission. This is something that the industry will have to do. Hello, Cheers. Hi, Annemarie. I see you exchange your bike for a boat. Yes and no. It's a canal bike. A great way to explore Amsterdam. But before I tell you more about this beautiful part of Amsterdam, Let's first watch my impression of the welcome reception. The welcome reception was in the historical winter garden of the hotel. The winter garden, often referred to as the wonder of the century, dates from 1879. The same year, Thomas Edison improved the light bulb, an innovation noticed by Mr. Krasnopolsky. Within three years, he replaced all the gas lamps in his hotel by these new Edison light bulbs. Many delegates were delighted to reconnect with one another during the evening event. Yes, the Amsterdam canals are one of a kind. Also, the Winter Garden was a nice location for the reception. For the rest of the week it will be used as our exhibition area by 28 exhibitors. Did you know that the Winter Garden was built by Mr. Krasnopolsky to profit from the World Expo of 1883 in Amsterdam? By coincidence, also with 28 exhibitors, showing all their countries had to offer. The participants and visitors of the Amsterdam World Expo in 1883 were already able to admire the beautiful canals. If you like to, I can show you a bit of the history in the building over there. That's fine. Meanwhile, we will watch the interview on regulatory fitness. As a well-known global trendsetter in the field of environmental legislation, Europe has developed an advanced regulatory environment in which the production and use of chemical products have to meet high environmental and safety standards. Once in a while, it's time for a fitness check. A fitness check is a comprehensive evaluation of a policy area. Yes, um, first of all, refit or fitness check is part of the better regulation program. So it's all about trying to cut red tape while maintaining whatever protection or objectives uh, that we have. And one of the instruments that we implement is all pieces of legislation at the EU now needs to be regularly evaluated. But um, what we do see with some concern is that member states continue to be enticed to, uh, to um, develop national policies on areas that should be harmonized. For instance, um, policies on nanomaterials. You can watch the complete interview on our YouTube channel. 
After this interview on regulatory fitness, let's check if our reporter already finished her fitness exercises on the canal bike. I see you made it. I'm at het Grachtenhuis. It's an old house but also a museum about the canals. The canals and the buildings surrounding it are what makes Amsterdam special. Most of the buildings were built in the 17th century, also called the Golden Age. A time of great wealth for the Netherlands. In a time the Dutch sailed around the world for trading purposes. The city was grown and there was a need for spatial development in combination with a good defense. The layout of the canals created nice evenly lots to build houses that were easily to sell. Many of these houses were not only houses but also functioned as merchant houses and warehouses. In 2010 the canals in Amsterdam were placed on the UNESCO World Heritage List. For centuries people lived around the canals, earned their money with trade, made art and celebrated life. The museum shows that history from 1600 up till now. Interesting. I'm already looking forward to tomorrow's report. And now it's time for our statement of the day. Today's statement is about data available under reach and the global impact of that availability. With us in our studio is Jean-Philippe Montfort of Maya Brown. Jean-Philippe is one of Europeans' leading legal practitioners, both on reach but also on liability. Um, he's based in Brussels, but fortunately for us in Amsterdam today, Jean-Philippe, welcome. Thank you. Are companies aware of the impact of data available under reach? The generation of this new data means potentially new information on hazard and risk, therefore new liabilities potentially, and they have to uh, anticipate and deal with that. The second thing is that uh, they, uh, in this data being registered, there is some confidential business information that they want to keep protected. That's another concern they have and should have. The third thing is that they want to avoid free riders just taking on the internet a few elements and writing Wikipedia type dossier uh, at no cost. And obviously that would be a, a breaching uh, the competition rules. Uh, another thing that they think, need to think about is that now with reach like legislation coming up in different countries, very much the same data will need to be uh, submitted in those countries and for, therefore the data holders will have a vested interest in trying to use their own data. And I think it's not too much about uh, making sure they get their money back somehow from those registrations in Korea or Taiwan, but it's also about making sure they control what data is being put forward so that new data is not being generated with a negative impact that can then uh, have to be taken into account also, for example, in an update on the EU REACH legislation or on the TOSCA in the US. So control of data is another objective. And your statement is? What should be the priority of companies with REACH-like legislation in other countries around the world? As explained yesterday, you can share your views on this statement with us. Jean-Philippe, thank you very much. Thank you. To wind up with a forecast. Today, a lot more about REACH. Our forecast shows ECA's regulatory strategy, REACH enforcement and REACH authorization, data sharing and CBI, and our grand finale today, China. Thank you for watching and enjoy your day.